How are you? This is Tony from Bay State Engines, located in the North Shore of Massachusetts. And today we're restoring this very beautiful Chrysler 250 horsepower inboard engine. Now, this is actually a Chrysler 340 for those of you in the automotive field. That goes by displacement, the marine field goes by horsepower, whatever, it's all the same. So today we're gonna to be talking about a couple of things before we put the bottom end of this engine together. We're gonna to be talking about the orientation of the rod on the crankshaft, the orientation of the piston on the rod, how to install the piston with the wrist pin and these awesome little spiral locks that aren't frustrating at all, and of course, the piston and how it installs into the cylinder itself. Try not to fall asleep. So the very first step before we install the pistons on our connecting rod is to determine which way the connecting rod faces. Being as this is a V-oriented engine, it has two banks of cylinders and two cylinder heads, meaning that the pistons install in opposite directions on the rod. Now the rods themselves are also directional. They have this little chamfer here located on the inside of the rod. Let me walk that a little closer to you. So this chamfer actually faces the outside of the crank pin. So if you come over here to the engine, this being connecting rod one, and the very front cylinder being cylinder number one, I want the chamfer to face towards the outside edge of the journal. Should it be flipped around the other way, there won't be enough relief here, and this will actually drag on the edge of the crankshaft journal. And you won't even be able to turn the engine over. Another thing that was a great piece of information that they gave us, and they show us the correct orientation of the pistons in this engine. This is a Chrysler 340, so we're using this guide right here. Towards the front of the engine, we see that all the valve reliefs face up. We already know this, but this is just something to help us not screw up in the future. Now that we flipped the engine over, you can see the cylinder side of the engine. We've shown you which way the rods face in relation to the crankshaft. Now all of the odd side bank rods will be facing the same direction, and the pistons will be facing the same direction. And the same goes for the even side bank of rods. If you're confused in any way as to how they go, it might help to mark these with a paint marker. That way you don't screw anything up that's completely obvious. You can even write on the piston to determine how that goes, and we're going to show you how that goes in the block right now. So these pistons have valve reliefs. This is so that when the valve opens and the piston approaches top dead center, there's no contact between these two parts. This is known as the quench area, is the area behind the valves, and this is the flat top of our piston. These are going to install this way, and on the other side of the block, they're going to install exactly the opposite way. So we're going to be installing these onto the rods in relation to the crankshaft. Now that we have the piston properly oriented on the rod and the wrist pin installed, we're going to go ahead and install these quite frustrating spiral locks. Some larger pistons tend to use two spiral locks, known as a dual spiral lock. Luckily, this engine only uses one. Now, the idea behind this is it's bigger than the bore that the wrist pin sits in, but this is going to provide tension towards the piston, holding the wrist pin into place, preventing it at any engine speed from coming out in theory. Personally, I think the spiral locks are kind of overkill. I've never seen a regular wrist pin lock fly out, but life is long, so we'll see if we can come across that in the future. What I'm doing here, I'm using my thumbnail to separate the lowest part of the spiral lock from the rest. We will end up having to stretch the whole assembly out like this to get it into place, but try not to go too crazy because if you do damage this, you will have to find another. So I'm going to go ahead and just barely get the lowest edge of the spiral lock into the groove using my pocket pry bar to make sure that it's in place. And once I've gotten it started, I'm going to start to work my way around and spin it into where it goes. This can take some time, especially if you've never done it before. But once you seem to get it going almost a full revolution from there on out, it seems to get a little bit easier. Again here, this is, you don't want to force anything. You kind of want to just take your time and roll this into place. I find that if you have to use more than your fingernail and this pry bar at the very end, that you're overdoing it just a little bit. So I've got most of the spiral lock in and all we have left is just this one little tabby here. So we're going to get this in the rest of the way to the point where I can now get the edge of this underneath 
and pop that in. You hear the click and you're done. Now that the piston and rod assembly is almost ready to install, we're going to install the remaining parts of the piston known as the piston ring. These are the parts that help the piston seal to the cylinder wall. This is going to be our top compression, our middle compression, and our oil control ring. Now, only the bottom compression ring has a top side to it with this little divot. That divot or letter or whatever is on your piston ring will always face up. I hope I'm getting that in focus for you. We're going to start with the lowest ring. We're going to start with our oil control ring. The oil control ring is kind of a sandwich setup so that when it is installed on the piston, it's going to look kind of like that. This helps to distribute oil on the, the cylinder wall as the piston travels up and down and lubricate the piston in the cylinder. You don't want to overdo it. Obviously, this is known as the oil control ring because it doesn't allow too much oil on the cylinder wall, but it is allowing the correct amount of oil in theory. So to put this on, we're going to take the wavy part and we're going to install that first. Luckily, this is the most flexible of all the rings, so this should be the easiest one to do. Whenever you're installing piston rings, especially on the end gap that is going in last, you can be very careful not to damage the side of the piston. That will need to be removed if you do create a burr. So I don't want these end gaps to line up. So here we are. There's our end gap. I'm going to put the bottom ring gap all the way over here. Hopefully get it started. I've done this before, I swear. And I'm just going to roll it into place. These ones are relatively flexible. And we're going to snap that in there. And then we're going to do the same with our top. But again, I don't want the end gaps to line up. So I am going to start this one all the way over here. There we go, there's our oil control ring. Going to move on to our lower compression ring. Once again, we're looking for this divot that designates the top of the ring. We'll take this and using our fingernails, we're just going to separate it just enough. There is a tool for this. Um, I don't typically use them, but some people do prefer them. They do make it a little bit easier but hopefully you only have to do this once every once in a long while so you won't really have to fight with it too much now even though these end gaps are lined up right now I am going to orient them so that they're all obscuring one another as they're installed in the cylinder we'll get to that later right before we lubricate these rings and install the piston just like that we've got all three rings installed on our piston Now that the piston assembly is ready for installation, I'm going to take this opportunity and put some two-cycle engine oil on these piston rings. The reason I'm using two-stroke oil is because I want it to burn off right after the engine starts running. This is really only there for the initial starting of the engine before I go ahead and the engine starts splashing all the pistons and cylinders with the lube that exists when the engine's turning over. So I'm going to make sure that that's on all the rings and in where it needs to be. Another opportunity I've taken is to orient these rings correctly. Hopefully you can see the end gap is one. My other end gap is maybe about, about 180 degrees from the other. And then the end gaps on the oil control ring are not lined up with the top two compression rings. I'm going to take a little bit of lube and put it on the skirts of the piston. Help ease our installation a little bit. I'm going to put this most of the way into the cylinder. It's going to go a little further than I want. Oh, that's okay. And then I have a piston ring compressor. This is a blue point model. I'm actually going to push the piston up a little bit. And I'm going to squeeze this down to grab it and compress all my rings about as far as I think it can go. There's really no gap in here for you to fit anything. Some people use a special piston installation tool. I don't necessarily find that to be the best thing. I mean, it's up to you, really. I'm going to hold this rod journal down here to prevent it from hitting the crank, and then I'm just going to use the butt of this and push this in, hopefully, in one or two nice fell swoops. Just like that, the piston is located in the bore, and we're ready to hook up the rod.